What's up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Mike Ruiz, and you're listening to the Sovereign Mindset Podcast. Today, I have on a special guest. He is an author, an entrepreneur, a father, a strength coach, someone who's inspired millions of people with his YouTube videos. And today, he's helping men become stronger with his King Transformation Program. With that said, I'd like to introduce Elliot Hulse to this channel. Elliot, thank you for being here. What's up, Mike? Happy to be here with you, buddy. Yeah, uh, glad to have you on. So I gave you a brief introduction there. Um, so I was wondering if you could expand on that, talk a little bit about your journey and you know your your evolution and how you got to building the King Transformation Program that you're uh, now involved with. Well, I'm a strong man, strength coach, father of four, father figure to millions of men worldwide, best known for making men strong. Uh, I have have over 2 million subscribers on YouTube. One of my channels has like 1.8. The other one has like 800,000. Men follow me and they follow my advice because I get get results. And so whether it be uh, helping them get stronger in their bodies, get stronger in their mind, their heart, their character, with fitness, business, women, uh, it's a matter of making men strong again in all ways, every day in this degenerate age. And so I started when I was very young. I, I, my uncle lived with me when we were like, when I was in elementary school and kindergarten, he used to teach me and my brother how to do push-ups and sit-ups and he used to chop bricks and do backflips. And it's like living with a Superman and I had a little bit of his DNA in me. So uh, I excelled in sports very quickly. Uh, he, he, he taught us how to train with barbells when I was in high school. And I knew at that moment that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. And so after you know earning a college scholarship, MVP, college football, uh, decided to go into the career of making, making people strong you know, as a strength coach. And so uh, here I am, what, 20 years later? <laughs> And, uh, and I'm grateful to be able to work that way in men's lives all around the, the world. When I started, there was no YouTube. I didn't even have an email address when I was in uh, college. So <laughs> it's, a bra- it's a brave new world. Yeah, definitely. So I'm wondering if you could then describe a little bit of how we got to this place where, you know, we do need men to be stronger, right? What is it about our society? You know, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. Uh, history, they're trying to change history, trying to change the culture, trying to it's like overturn established scientific norms. You know, they're trying to say that men can be women and men can have periods. And so it just seems to me that there is this kind of crisis brewing around masculinity and uh, I was wondering if you can expand upon that and, and talk about how you're trying to push back against that. Well, it turns out that this is a pretty predictable pattern in the rise and fall of empires. <laughs> and, uh, and we just happen to be at the fall of an empire. And it's interesting because it's not just the fall of an empire, but it seems like it's a global issue now because as the empire goes so the globe especially in this day and age with our connectivity so as america goes so does the globe and america has been subverted america has been subverted for quite some time um but most notably after the two world wars when the the subverters of russia you know the 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 bolshevik revolutionaries it's always these revolutionaries uh were for various reasons, scattered, kicked out, and many of them uh, were imported to the United States. Uh, a lot of these men came together, very brilliant men, all happened to be Jewish, uh, created uh, an institution called the, um, the Frankfurt School, where they would disseminate their revolutionary ideas because unlike in Eastern Europe, they weren't going to subvert the West, particularly America, with, 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 uh, with violence. And they weren't going to do it through class warfare because in America, there, there was no class warfare because we have a huge middle class. So in, in the way that they could pit, you know, the proletariat against the establishment, really couldn't do that in America because 
everyone had an opportunity in America. It really didn't even even prior to the you know so-called civil rights movement, uh, blacks were upward mobile in America. Women were given great opportunity for upward mobility in America. It really and truly is was at, particularly at that time the 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 the, the place for growth and opportunity, right? Um, so they, what they did was, among many things, were to, uh, well, subvert the population through the media, through the music, through the schools, through the government. I mean, they got their, they got their fingers in absolutely everything. And, um, and through that means, through the means of those institutions, Antonio Gramsci, one of the creators of cultural Marxism, because that's what we're talking about right now, um, called it the long march of the institutions. Uh, what, what their main objective in this subversion process was, to, of course, to, to dis- the only way you were going to install communism in, a, in the West is you've got to destroy or pervert the culture. That's the, and they recognize that. And the way you, do, you pervert the culture is by perverting the, the, the religion. They had, to, they had to de-Christianize the West. He said that. So what do you do? You subvert the church. And we know that the church was subverted. Bella Dodd. There were, uh, you know, something like 300 semin- homosexual seminaries that were implanted into the, into the church. Uh, where we now get all this scandal. So, you know, they subverted the church by by filling it up with homosexuals. Um, and then, of course, Hollywood denigrates and the schools denigrate anything religious, uh, particularly Christianity. So, you know, we're there now where most of us are atheists. Most people, you know, they have, they actually, the antichrist spirit is so strong that you even say Jesus and people quiver. Um, so they, it worked. Uh, but then, you know, not only that, it's about destroying the father, but also destroying the father destroying the men. And you destroy the men on multiple different fronts. Number one, through feminism, by making men into oppressors, turning them into bad guys, um, challenging the institution of marriage, which it, which works, has always worked, regardless of what a lot of the propaganda today tries to tell us about how bonobos and their sexual lifestyles are, which, uh, you know, basically they're just a bunch of... Uh, monkeys that that masturbate and bow down to their female counterparts uh we're not bonobos when we're like chimps but anyway <laughs> uh you know this so they they destroyed our sexuality destroyed the home destroyed the family destroyed the man and so goes the nation and this is where we are right now this is why we've got so much uh confusion and we we're so perverted that we take things that are that are almost like wow i can't believe that's even an issue and, and we hold it high in, in some special regard. Of course, today we're dealing now with transgenderism and uh, we've got our lovely new president who says that it's okay for boys to uh, put on a wig and compete against girls in their sports. And you know, any man who decides that he wants to identify as a woman can follow my daughter into the bathroom and, uh, and, and then I'm a racist or something if I'm against that. So it's, it's retarded <laughs> to tell you <laughs> simply. Yeah, you know, um, it does feel like society is getting, I would say, blindsided by a lot of this because it's been hidden in the institutions for so long. And it feels like we've now gotten to a place where a lot of this stuff is starting to accelerate and come out into the mainstream culture. And everybody's looking around saying, whoa, I didn't even know that this was an issue. And now it's all of a sudden brought to the to the forefront. But I mean, you touched on a lot of things right there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get into was like, so Hollywood, the media and the propaganda that goes through there. And it's like a slow, it's a slow indoctrination process, right? Uh, they've been doing it for decades. My wife and I, we've been watching, uh, you know, videos and movies from the past. And now that we're aware of it, we're starting to recognize that, wow, this has been going on for a long time. They've been slowly subverting us. And it's mm-hmm. like they introduced these ideas that are so radical, right, that you originally reject them because they're just not in line with what we know to be true, not in line with our biological DNA and not in line with our, you know, just how we are as human beings. But then they repeat it over and over and over in these, and they, they put them into the movies, they put them into the shows and they put them into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so I guess to what extent has media and propaganda and the propaganda associated with that really infiltrated our society 
and how much damage has it done, been has been done and how can we overcome that well this is an old strategy apparently i'm listening to uh the audiobook by uh saint augustine uh the the city of god and it's like a it's an old old book but he talks about basically the fall of rome it begins with the fall of rome and one of the before the rome was starting to fall one of the you know some of the um pontiffs that wanted to preserve it had like really strange rules like for example he didn't allow the theater in rome he was like no there will be no theater and you know you'd think like well that's weird why can't you can't you just entertain the people but it's because he recognized that the people are perverted by the stories that they that they take in and the, and it, the storytellers are the ones that own the theaters and they're the ones that control the minds and so Hollywood, if you don't know, Hollywood, the term Hollywood comes from a tree, a holly tree. And the holly tree is where uh, the, the Druids would get their magic wand to hypnotize and to cast spells on their prey, you know. And so uh, just the term Hollywood itself, you got to understand that it is a it's a it's a great brainwashing. The whole industry, the whole Hollywood industry is a great brainwashing to pervert the culture. And it, it's simple because you don't have to tell people what to do if you just show them the example of it, right? You don't have to tell people uh, that it's okay and that you should wanna have promiscuous sex and, uh, and, uh, and, and not get married and to you know, abort your babies and to, and to live a a, a promiscuous lifestyle. You don't have to tell them that. You don't. You can't promote that to people. A lot of like, mm. uh, especially a culture that has moral standards, and you say that to them in the 1950s. If you say that, they would, you know, the women would be like, "No, that's actually not right." And there's good reason why they were more religious than too. No, you don't have to tell them anything. You just plant it. You just throw it up on a screen and show it to them, and they sit there in that passive state. They take it in, and then it becomes embedded in their consciousness, and then they think it to be something that. Well, everyone's doing because they saw it on Netflix today, right? I have mm -hmm. to be very careful with my children because they'll end up watching things that confuse them. And then I have to go back and do cleanup work because I'm like, just because you see it on Netflix does not make it right. In fact, Netflix is probably the greatest brainwashing machine right now that, 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 that lives. Every Netflix show, and I don't watch Netflix, but I just know this by what people tell me and from the news stories, uh, there, it's designed to pervert, to pervert, to pervert and to uh, retell the story of history, to reconstitute sexuality, to turn, uh, it's racist, you know, for the most part, uh, it's a matter of blackwashing history and turning people against whites. You know, there's one kid just asked me recently and I'm gonna do a video for him. Why does it seem that the world is demonizing whites? Well, look at the media and look what they're doing. And then of course, men, it comes to, it boils down to men. Even look like, I was watching this video the other day by this guy named Steven, I think it's Stephen Pregu. He does his videos about um, symbolism and, and he uses a lot of movies. And he talks about like, uh, for example, and I recognize this when I watched that movie, The Incredibles, how the incredible movie, you know, the, the father was a superhero, but he was, he was just too overwhelming. And so they had to sit him down and then the wife becomes the hero, right? Not only mm -hmm. does wife become the hero, which is, you know, <laughs> again, you know, Hollywood is retarded. Uh, not only does wife become the hero, but then the father can't even do anything at home. He can't play her part, right? Because he screws everything up. He can't make cereal and change diapers or whatever. But she can go out there, and now the woman is a superhero. You look at like the new, the new um, uh, Ghostbuster movie, all woman cast. And then that, you know, apparently there was a scene where you know one of the men who were you know the original Ghostbusters, uh, he, he gets like blown out of a building and he dies. And, you know, the women look down on him and like, well, I guess he wasn't cut out for it. All of a sudden it's it is so strange because it's sexist against women to try to make them men, because yeah. it's like saying that, well, men are better than you, stronger than you, smarter than you, more, all these things. And that's not fair. So let's 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 which is fake in Hollywood. Let's make you like them. All the superheroes are women. And what that does is a number of things. Of course, it confuses everybody. Mm -hmm. but, that, but really, it makes 
it, it's sexist towards women because a woman's value is in the space that she can create. And they're not acting like space creators, they're acting like space invaders, which are men. Men are space invaders, women are space creators. But there's no value in that. There's no value in that. And they, they actually, in fact, denigrate it to be a mother, which is a space creator, to be a homemaker, which is a space creator. They denigrate that, like there's no value in it. But at the same time, they say that women are oppressed. Well, of course, because you're oppressing them through media by telling them that their value is in being a man. And then making men, on the other hand, put, put on dresses like a lot of these fools in Hollywood and in the media do now today. And everybody thinks it's great. Cheer them on. Yeah, um, you know, that's <laughs> you're going into all these topics that I want to touch on. One of those is that it just seems like the media at every chance they get, they denigrate the male father figure. Right. And um, mm -hmm. they also push masculinity on the female. And if right. the way I've noticed in life is that you need a balance for a healthy, happy like relationship between a man and a woman and their children. You need a balance between that father figure, that uh, that uh, female energy. And when you get both trying to be the masculine or both trying to be feminine, you know, that's an imbalance that occurs. And it just seems like that imbalance is being pushed and promoted yeah. by all types of institutions and, and, and media organizations, like overwhelmingly. It's, it's just like you said, it's even in, in kids movies and all of that. And, you know, they always portray the father as some dopey uh you know, he's there, but yeah, we don't really need him kind of thing like that. And right. Or 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 some kind of a, a wife beater or, mm -hmm. you know, abuser, which. So most of the times that's BS. Yeah. So, um, you know, going through my life, what I've noticed, I've noticed a recurring theme, though. I've noticed that the most successful, uh, the most confident men, um, when you look back on their history, they had a really strong father figure, really strong male presence in their lives. And so. I guess I'm wondering if you could expand upon that. What, um, why is it that a man is so important in the upbringing of a young man? Well, when a boy and a girl are both born, they both have the same sense of self that's attached to the mother, right? They don't know themselves different than the mother. In fact, ego psychology tells you that when, when a baby is a baby, it doesn't know the difference between itself and its mother. It thinks it's its mother mm. until the ego starts to develop. And so but for both the male and female, there is a love loss relationship. There's a break from the mother that just happens once they recognize they have their own ego and they start developing their own ego. You know that it happens when the baby starts saying no. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to give him something. He's like, wait a second. No, you're over there. I'm over here. Right. So that's a healthy thing. That's a healthy thing. It's a healthy, healthy break from the mother. But there needs to be a second break from the mother for the boy. The boy has to be has to has to have two breaks because there comes a point, usually around age three or four, that he recognizes, and the little girl recognizes that oh, there is a contrast between me and mom. So the little girl, she only has that one break, ego break, but she knows herself sexually because I am still like my mother in the way that we are both females. Not so for the little boy, and when that little boy recognizes, when he has that conscious awareness that okay. Not only am I not my mom, right? Because nobody does this consciously, but no, but that break happens naturally. But I'm not like my mom in that she's a woman and I'm a man. Who am I? And this is why it's so important. Men can only become men with other men around. Otherwise, they stay like women because then their ego and their, their mindset, their psychology is still based on the heartbeat of their mama. They need to be able to look up and see what a man is a good, strong example, a contrast to the mother. And so if there's no father there, there's no male figure there, or there's a weak father there, or a weak male figure there, the boy can't look up and recognize, oh, that's my pattern. That's where the word father comes from, pattern, pattern. That's my pattern. Let me pattern my behavior after him because obviously he and I are alike. And this can get perverted in many different ways as well. Even if there's a strong father there, but the mother silently resents the father, the boy will want to save the mother from the father. This is where you get the Oedipal complex from, which I think Freud was wrong. He was describing perverted families. That's not the natural family. Natural family, the mother should support. First of all, she should be subservient to the father. She should understand the natural order in the home and allow the father and her husband to lead rather than being a Jezebel and trying to usurp power, usurp power. When she recognizes the authority of the father, then the children recognize the authority of the father. And then the son is, feels that much more compelled to 
take after the father. Or in a lot of these worlds, even if there is a father there in this world, because the father, the mother is and has animosity towards the father, the boy has a hidden animosity towards the father, and then there's a co, a co, uh, like a hidden conspiracy between the boy and the mother against the father. And you see this in a lot of, I sort of experienced that a little bit when I was a kid growing up and I had some resentment towards my father. So I grew mm -hmm. up and recognized sort of what happened and that I am my father. So this is, a, this is the war against fathers, against families, against masculinity that has really perverted our entire culture. And is that part of this Marxist kind of agenda that's creeping into our lives? Is that, is that what they do? You know, um, because it just seems like that's their playbook, you know, that, and like you, you mentioned, they have to go after religion. They have to go after all these things that help the individual strengthen their identity to something. And that way, it seems to me that that way the state can come in or the party or the political class and tell the individual how to think, what is the truth and how they should act. Is that kind of your feeling as well? Well, you gotta understand that this is deep seated in our DNA. This is, this is a part of the plight of being a human man and woman. This is a part of, of living in a fallen state. And so we've been, we've been playing this screwed up game since Adam and Eve. We've been doing this for a very, very long time, but the Marxist subversion takes advantage of that where religion puts borders up against it. This is why it's important to have the boundaries that are available only through religion because religion tells you, okay, wait a second, just because you feel that, just because you think that, just because you sense it, don't mean it's true. Just because that feels good don't mean you have to do it. Doesn't mean that it's right. Religion is a guard against this fallen and, and, and slippery slope into the fallen, fallen state that we find our culture in, totally mm -hmm. fallen. But we have a propensity towards it because if you just look at what happened in the garden, Adam was effeminate and Eve was a feminist. Adam, he, he screwed up from the beginning because, and so did men in many ways today. And you know we can go back full circle, but you just look at what Adam did. Adam didn't protect his wife's mind and the integrity of her soul because he allowed the snake into the garden. It was his job to protect her. He was supposed to protect her from, that, from the serpent, but the serpent snuck in and secretly whispered in her ear. And not only did Adam not protect her from that, but when she was finally subverted by, that, by the demonic pull, he then yielded his responsibility and allowed her to be in control rather than listening to his father, rather than following God's law, rather than do what we're doing was right, rather than using his reason, he became effeminate because he decided, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna piss off my wife. I don't, wanna be, I don't wanna be away from my wife and I'm just gonna do what she wants to do. I mean, I guess it's okay, right? Because she's doing it. And so he, fo he started following her lead. Well, where did that end up? Well, expelling from the garden and Cain killed Abel and everything from there, there on end, right? That whole plight of humanity and our struggle from that one, from that one uh, fallen act. And we see it repeated day in and day out, but there are no guards against it. Not only today are there no guards against it, but that's held up in high regard. You know, guys say stupid shit like, no uh, happy wife, happy life. Uh, women take charge and men just fall back and allow that to be that way. You know, we're being lazy and they're being usurpers. It's a perfect, we work perfectly together that way in a very diabolical way. It's wrong. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, that's funny that you, you mentioned that, you know, it just, it feels like the barbarians are at the gate, right? And there's nobody there to protect it. Like all the men have kind of succumbed to this, you know, placid way of being, you know, we're just accepting of the circumstances that are being pushed upon them. And so I guess for men today who are recognizing what's happening and who are saying, wait a second, there's something that needs to be done and who are, you know, gravitating towards values and gravitating towards their masculinity, their natural calling to protect uh, the civilization from this, you know, uh, downward spiral. How, like, what advice do you have for them? You know, because they're going to face a lot of challenges. I feel like 
as you start to grow, as you start to become a stronger version of yourself, as you start to embrace your values and you really learn to defend them, that is when you are going to get attacked. And, um, you know, for a lot of men, they realize that and they don't do anything. But for still those that do want to do something, what's, what advice do you give to them? Well, it depends on what you want in life. I think it's good to have family. In fact, that's why we, that was the whole point of bringing women into the fold with the, you know, even when Rome first started, when it was still just a backwoods nation, was it was just all men. And it was like, okay, this is great. You know, this is fine. Like, because we're, the, we, we fought off the enemy, we're protecting, but there's no hope for the future. There's no hope for the future if there's no women. Right. It's that's it. Like, what are you guys going to do? Right. You're just being you're, you're tough, man. You're strong, man. Right. You're powerful, man. You're protecting men. But ultimately, we got to have a future. We got to have children. We have to bring women in. And that was something that they they wanted to do. And they had to they had to fight hard for this. You could study the, the history of Rome. But it, it was the way it started was like these men were strong men. They were good men, but they recognized they needed a future. And as a result, they when they would conquer. They you know, first they try to do it the nice way, you know, like, you know, could we could we trade, you know, bring some women in. But then they had to go and they had to conquer because nobody wanted to do that. They nobody wanted to give up the women. Um, and then, you know, they bring them into the into into the role of future creators. Right. That means what? Family. That means having children. It means building nuclear families. Right. Nuclear families, it, a lot of people, would, they try to make you believe that nuclear families is like a, a new thing that was created from Christianity, but it wasn't. And if you even study the barbarians, they were very much monogamous, right? It wasn't just mm. a, a Roman, con, uh, a Roman uh, thing that they made up. You know, it was something that's been here for a long time because they recognize that if we're going to have a strong future, that these boys or, these, or the children need to have a mother and a father. It just, mm -hmm. it's basic. It just makes sense. And so to, to first of all, we got to got to get over ourselves and get over this YOLO, this YOLO way of living where mm -hmm. it's just like, well, you know, I'm just going to do me. Because if you wake up, you some people will have this tendency, well, I'm just going to do me then, right? I'm just going to make money. I'm going to buy cars and I'm just going to, you know, live a life of hedonism. I'm just going to have fun because it's only one life. Well, that's effeminate. Because it, what men are designed to do, what men in our heart to do is to want to create. We want to create, we want families, and we want something to protect. We want somebody to provide for, rather than just providing for ourselves. It's not in a man's nature to be selfish. It's in a woman's nature to be selfish. It's not in a man's nature to be selfish. It's in a woman's nature to be selfish because she, it's within herself that babies are born, they're grown. She needs to be self-centered. Women need to be self-centered because, because they have to protect two. And sometimes they have to protect many, but it's not, and that's in their nature because they're the ones that carry. Men don't carry babies that way. So it's more of a man's nature to want to protect that, to want to provide for that, to want to give. It's in our nature not to be selfish, but when a man starts living in this uh, hedonistic, backwards, fallen world, they start becoming selfish, which is very, very effeminate. So my, this is just my opinion, a lot of this stuff, is make a family. You got to have a family. Marry a woman, make babies. Now, that being said, there's a very good argument against that today because the institution of marriage has been subverted by the government, where it's no longer an agreement between a man and a woman and the God, God the Father, but it, this, it, this, this state that owns that marriage. And so you get a state license and you got to sign a, a state marriage agreement. And even if you do, even if you just live with a woman for a couple of years and you don't even get the state involved, they're already involved because the state has subverted the fathers, the fate, the state has become the daddy and husband, not the man. So with that being said, how do you go about having a traditional family? Cause that's really what, what we got to go back to because tradition works. Right, all progress is not good progress. The progressive one always always make you think that progress is good. Progress could just be progressing us down into hell. Progress is not always what is cracked up to be. Tradition is something we could look back and say, "Oh, that works." Progress is 
Let's make it up as we go along. Maybe this will work because where they get these utopian ideas from that never actually end up working or end up panning out. Traditional conservative families, that's what works. And for that to work, the way for that to work is to have number one, an authority within the family. Number two, the father, the authority in the family should have an authority himself, God the father so that the marriage is blessed with the graces of faith. There's got to be faith involved with it. Because, see, the, the way the state was able to come in and subvert the family was because there was no, because the church was subverted and religion was subverted. And everybody's atheist, so it's like if you don't have the true divine God, you have to have the fallen state God. It's, but it's going to be a God either way. But yeah. when the divine father is the intermediary, is the cohesive bond with your family, then number one, that marriage is for eternity. There will be no divorce. Divorce is not go a good idea, folks. And you know why divorce, part of the reason why divorce happens is because you know what else is not a good idea? Fornication is not a good idea, folks. Fucking outside of marriage ain't a good idea because you know the easiest way to get subverted by the female is get addicted to her sex. And this is where most of these young men are. And then they get married and realize, oh shit, I didn't know this woman. I've been having sex with her for four years, but I've been blinded by the sex goggles. And now that she got me, I realize, and you know what happens when you get married to a woman that you're addicted to her sex through sex goggles? She usually starts taking that sex away once you get married. Yeah. Right, because there was nothing, she used it as a tool to get you, but she don't need it to keep you anymore because she already got you. So stop fornicating, stop the adultery, which is, anything outside of your marriage. I don't care if, if you think it's okay or not. It's once God puts two people together, that's it, especially if they start having children. When mm -hmm. people get bored, 90% of divorces are initiated by women and they think they could just hop from carousel, you know, hopping on carousel and hopping off. So these are, I'm just kind of ranting a little bit here, but mm -hmm. these are all things that need to be taken into consideration with regard to how we're living. We're living poorly. We're living self selfishly. And that a, or a call back to tradition is the only thing that's going to save us. Yeah, um, I'm I'm starting to notice that from my own personal life and just growing up. I'm on the later end of the millennial generation. I'm probably the oldest at the older end, and you know, I just now I have a lot of life experience where I've noticed that a lot of the way that we've been told or led to believe how we should live our lives. It, and a lot of that breaks tradition is actually the way, you know, tradition is actually the way in which we build a cohesive, happy life, a simple life, not one of materialism and always looking beyond yourself for validation or for happiness or something like that. And embracing tradition is, is more in line with our, you know, biological and, and, and ancestral upbringing. And it's led me to look at Christianity from a practical perspective. Now I start to realize, oh, wow, there's a lot of value in Christianity. There's a lot of value in this structure. A lot of this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I'm wondering for you, were you always a Christian? And how did you come to embrace Christianity and see that as the way to, a, to structure your life and your beliefs and your thoughts? Well... By the grace of God, I was baptized as a youth, as a baby. I was, I, my parents baptized me, even though my parents left the church shortly thereafter. They baptized all four of our children. They put us through religious education. And then basically we abandoned the church at that time. And so I abandoned it too. You know, I didn't think much of it. In fact, I had all the antichrist beliefs about it. I had all kinds of negative ideas about it. I had all kinds of hangups. Um, so I was, a, I was living in the spirit of the time, which is purely antichrist. And so I, with that void, I searched and I've, I, all, I had looked into all kinds of religions, man, because when you don't have that father, when you, right, because I have my earthly father, but that's not enough. As a man, we need the divine father. This is why during initiation processes, the older men would pull the, pull the young boy out of the home and he would initiate him, but they didn't leave the boy alone with just their own fleshly leadership. They would always point them to the father. They would always point above. They would say, look, it's the fathers above, right? Whether they are pagan or, or, or monotheistic, it was always a point above. It was like, no, it's not about this. It's not about me. It's not about this flesh. It's about what's above. And so 
that I think that's a natural, there's a natural hankering there. Of course, we've been subverted by scientism, which is the re new religion of the day. Yeah. Right. Um, and so a lot of people, are, you know, they're, they're quote unquote atheists, but that's not rational at all. And if they really would take some time and put their ego aside for a moment, they'll recognize that, you know, first of all, that's a religion too. And you're believing in the almighty man rather than the creator, people who, who worship the creation rather than the creator, which, you know, that's a totally different story. Where the heck am I going? I'm talking in circles. <laughs> no, you, I was wondering how you got to Christianity. Ah, uh, good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I searched, I searched because that hole was there, right? That emptiness was there. And I probably dabbled with almost every religion there is, right? And of course, there's this false ecumenism that rules the world today, where it's like, you know, every religion is okay. Just, just, just worship any fallen angel that you want, any demon that you want, right? Entire nations are ruled by fallen angels. And so, but we want to import that here. Look at India. India doesn't pro progress. Why? Because they are still worshiping gurus and fallen angels, right? The West progressed. Why? Because of monotheism, because of God, the father, the pattern, Jesus Christ, the church. That's why the West was what it was. But we want to throw that out for the novelty of, and I did, you know, I want to throw it out for the novelty of, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Uh, and then, you know, we got the new age and the new age, you know, chakras and crystals and tarot cards and, you know, all this like woo woo stuff, all, all imported here to subvert, to destroy the West. Cause you have to de-Christianize. I got and a I question about it. that. Is it, is is there any, I know you, so you've dabbled in a lot of that stuff. Is there any value there still in Buddhism, Hinduism? And like, can you still extract little pieces of value from that or no? They're incomplete. Mm -hmm. There's value, but there's incomplete because God is either not mentioned like, like Buddha, right? So there's no, mm -hmm. there's no consideration for the, for the, for the creator. For the divine. Or, right. Or he's absent. He created the world and just kind of stepped off. Mm -hmm. He's absent. But only through Christianity does our God have compassion enough for us that he came to show of himself through his son and to partake in our suffering as fallen men. It's the only religion where our God loves us that much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the pagan religions, their, their gods have moods and they got to pacify the moods of their gods. Mm -hmm. but Christianity, our God loved us and continues to love us and shows us that through his sacrifice with us in our fallen state. He has mm -hmm. compassion. And uh, I started to move in that direction when I fell for a lot of the fallen religions, a lot of the fake religions. Um, again, like I, I, I was into it. I dabbled into it. I was, I was about it. I was really searching. I was seeking, but I always ended up short. I always, there was always something missing. And a part of what was missing is that these religions, a lot of them are permissive. Even I was into the Baha'i faith, which is uh, which is an Ab a quote unquote it's supposedly an Abrahamic faith, but it was still very permissive. My wife and I were talking about a Baha'i woman that we knew uh, the other day, which you know comes out of Islam, and Islam is not very permissive. Mm -hmm, They're yeah. Abrahamic, and they still hold true to the boundaries. Their boundaries, are. but the Baha'i faith. We met this woman; she was married like four times already. So what I was looking for, and a lot of people, a lot of people think they want from their religion, but ultimately ends up leaving them empty is a permissive religion, a religion that kind of says, it's your truth. You do what you want. What do your feelings say about that? If you think it's okay, God loves you anyway. Uh, that leads to chaos. When there are no boundaries, we fall into chaos. And I started, my life started falling into chaos because I didn't have any boundaries because I was, I was believing in these fall, you know, new age religions. So it was just a matter Whatever my soul is doing is okay. And mm -hmm. it's, it turned out that that wasn't okay. And I found myself in a very fallen state, very dark state. And I, did, I really didn't know what to do or where to turn, but I had started fasting, right? Because I had this sense that God wanted me to fast. I started fasting. And as a result, I was looking for information. I was looking for inspiration, really. I had all the information I needed. I was looking for inspiration, in fasting, and I was I was led to the writings of the early fathers in the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox tradition of fasting, which still is strong today in the Orthodox faith, where they fast every Wednesdays and Fridays. You know, Orthodox can fast up to like five, 200 days a year. Yeah. And so I started reading the mystical writings of the early fathers, the Philokalia, and I 
I was so astonished to find that Christianity has deep mystical roots and that there that there are strong boundaries and that there it's it's very spiritual I, because I in my fallen or in my antichrist state I thought Christianity was like superficial and dumb but when I found the orthodox faith I was like wow it's actually deeper than anything I've ever it's deeper but not only deeper more practical it's more practical and it's deeper than anything else that i ever experienced because a lot of religions you know a lot of the eastern religions are deep but they're not practical like yeah that's deep but that's not practical where the where the uh christian faith was deep and practical and that's why there was an order it the the west was built through the judeo-christian order christianity offered an order a way of living. That's what logos means, right? And in St. John's gospel, he says in the beginning, there was logos. Logos was a term that was, that comes from Greek. And the Greeks were that close. The Greek, the, probably the reason why Christianity pro proliferated more in the, in the West is because the Greeks were this close, you know, with Plato and, and Socrates and Aristotle, they were this close in understanding that there was a logos, that there was a ruling order. All Christianity did was take that logos, affirm it, and say, then logos became man. God became man. So all of a sudden it took the logos as from something being above us and being high to being present with us and compassionate and loving towards us. So like uh stoicism, like you know, a lot of the philosophies of uh Greek and Greek, the Greece is the foundation that allowed Christianity to proliferate. It was like the soil that the seed of Christianity set in that brought reason and spirit together. And it's like, that's why the West won. That's why the West was so amazing. And so I, I got into orthodoxy. That's how I got into the church, but I'm not orthodox. I wasn't, I wasn't baptized orthodox. And I was thinking about going to the orthodox church and I was like, man, um, I need, I need, God was telling me to confess my sins. He was like, look at the way you're living right now. You know, this is contrary to your reason. And he was like, you need to go and confess. I was like, what do you mean confess? Like, who am I going to confess to? What am I going to do? Like, I'm going to, and he put it, laid it on my heart to go to the, 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 the sacrament of reconciliation that's available through my gift as a baptized Catholic. I was like, wow, I actually don't need to search anymore. God gave me this gift as a baby. You have, you've been through all the sacraments, go and reconcile yourself, atone with me through the sacraments of reconciliation. And, and so I went and I confessed and, uh, and I did my penance and I'm still mortifying my flesh to this day to purify myself from a lot of, a lot of mistakes I made. This is where I am right now anyway. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh... That is a familiar course from my life as well. So uh, it's good to hear that story and articulate it that way. It gives me a lot of perspective as well. Um, but there was something you mentioned about a lot of these <clears throat> religions being permissive. And I'm noticing that today with Christianity as well, at least with the Christian churches that I see around my neighborhood, you know, it seems like they're accepting to all types of behaviors. There isn't any real boundaries. You're seeing these things where, you know, they're embracing like degenerate forms of progressivism. Uh, you know, the signs are on the, on, on the, in the front of the church saying, oh, all, you know, everyone welcome. We're a progressive church. And, uh, you know, then you, they have like the Black Lives Matter stuff on there where, you know, it's just, it's to me at this point, I think you could easily see that the head of that organization is like a Marxist movement you know and it just seems like marxism christianity they don't go hand in hand so what's actually happening at, like at at the level of the christian church have they been completely subverted and how should someone go about like trying to restore their faith or, or find jesus christ when it seems like the institutions are now being subverted to this degenerate culture yeah, you're 100% right, you know, and Christ is for everyone. Christ Christ wants everyone to be reconciled to the Father through him. But it requires a mending of your life. And because in this world, we are our own gods, you know, people, again, you know, atheists or people just don't think about it, they still have a God. Everybody still has a God. And, and the, the major God is ourselves. 
And it's what do I want? How do I want to live? What do I feel? Me, 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 me. So what's very, what's very offensive to them, to people is yes, Christ would love, Christ wants to save you, but you you have to amend your life. You have to amend your life. You gotta, you gotta repent, which means turn around. This is what Christ says, you go and preach repentance and belief. So it's not enough to believe in the Bible and people will just, they want you to believe in the Bible, right? These, these churches come believe in the Bible, but then nobody asks you to repent because it's offensive to people's gods, which is themselves. Repent means turn around. Repent means, okay, I have to admit I've been wrong. I'm doing wrong and I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn around and I'm make, I'm going to make a good effort to, and I'll even go a little bit further, but to, and to make up, you know, a re reparations for my past sins because you're going to pay now or you're going to pay later and so when you talk about subversion and the church i mean this is a this is a long time coming this is a long time coming and we could look as far back as uh was it 1500 when martin luther decided he no longer felt like he wanted to abide by the church that's when the church started falling apart and now we got christianity which is basically you make up your own christianity as you know as long as they say jesus and bible it's like you make up your own and that is a that is a usurpation of of apostolic apostolic power, which which Christ gave to His Church, which is the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. That's the church Christ founded. And so, if you go, I watched this meme the other day. It was pretty interesting. This guy Google searched all mm -hmm. the different religious denominations and who started them. You know, okay, so, you know Martin Luther, uh, Calvin you know, and so on and so forth. You know, they're, they're all started by certain people, John Wesley, uh, the guy, that, they're all of them, I can't remember his name, but there are all these different founders of these various different denominations of Christianity. But if you search who founded the Catholic church, Jesus Christ founded the Catholic church. So a lot of these churches, they're not even, if you're not in the one true church, you're in a, you're in a protest church. That's what Protestant means means we protested. You can't, there's no grace in protesting. This is the same attitude that the quote unquote Marxist revolutionaries have. M Martin Luther was a, was a revolutionary, just like uh, Marx and Stalin, you know? He was a revolutionary, just like Barack Obama, <laughs> right? So if you follow, if you follow any church outside of the Catholic church, and I, when I say Catholic church, I also mean the Orthodox. And this is just my opinion. I put them together. There was a schism between the two of them, but I think it's a silly schism. Um, and again, that's just my opinion. And, and I hold them both in the same regard. I, I, lo I love the Orthodox tradition. I love how they stay true to their conservative values. Um, but they too, just like the Catholic church as well, have been subverted and, and, uh, as, and, are turning communists. And, and, and so this is where I got to go. You got to take a few steps back. So anything post 19 or the 1500 Martin Luther, all that stuff, those are fake churches, in my opinion, right? I don't want to piss a lot of people off, but look, it, they're, they're Protestant. You're a protest against the one church that Christ established. You're protesting against Christ's church. However you look at it, however you want to justify it, whatever the case may be, it's a protest against Christ's church. Christ's church is in its passion these days, which means that so the, the church, so society goes as the church goes. And we see that because we've got a fake president in the United States. And what do we have for the past few years? A fake Pope. Let me back up now. The church is going through its passion. They say that the church will go through its passion the same way that Christ went through his passion. Christ's passion, of course, he, uh, uh, his passion began with the, uh, with the betrayal of Judas, one of his own. One of his own betrayed him. What do we have today as the church is going through? It's, the church will follow the path of Christ. And what do we have today? We see that there's a complete betrayal. There's a betrayal by the, by the bishops, by the, you know, uh, it's not nice. It's not good to talk out against the Pope, but I can't help it. The Pope is just by his, his actions is a communist. He, everything he's doing is, is communist. And, 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 Again, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of a brand new Catholic. Please forgive me, but where did he come from? Right, like there was we had uh, Benedict, who was a conservative pope, 
And then all of a sudden there was scandal, which we know was because there were the, the, the church was seated by homosexuals in order to pervert it, to destroy it some 50, 60 years ago. And so that was used against Benedict, who was a conservative, to kind of push him aside so that the Marxists or the, you know, the Freemasons could uh, install their own communist church dictator. And so if you look at the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, it's tough, man, because we ha there's a strong conservative traditionalist movement that's happening in the church. And there's a, there's a huge awakening inside the church right now. But like you mentioned, too, not just the Protestant churches that are, you know, very effeminate. But the Catholic Church is hard to find a it's hard to find a, a good Catholic Church that's led by a strong a strong leader. Um, but there will always be a remnant. Christ promises that there will always be a remnant. There will be even if it's a small amount. And I think, and there's also another promise that uh, as sin abound, grace is poured on even heavily, more heavily. Uh, there's a big movement. As, as dark as it's getting, there's a there's a strong, powerful light that's emerging. And it's emerging in the traditionalist movement of the church. And I think a lot of people, even outside of the, the Catholic church, they're starting to recognize, even a lot of Protestants are starting to recognize they need the sacraments. They're recognizing that they need tradition. They recognize and will have to ultimately recognize that they have to stop rebelling and stop being revolutionaries because that revolutionary spirit is the, is, is the Marxist antichrist movement that's mm -hmm. happening in and around us. Cool. Wow, yeah, um, that's a lot to take in. I've been coming, becoming more familiar with the Catholic Church as well, and learning a little bit about their history. I mean, all of this is like, like you said, I'm not a scholar or anything like that. A lot of my knowledge is brand new. Um, but uh, I do want to close this off with some like solutions for people that are just waking up to this kind of world, who have been like, you know, basically sleepwalking and now recognizing whoa all of this stuff is just coming to light so what can what can people do especially young men um you know when when they look out into their future and they see oh wow this is pretty bleak you know there's possibility of economic collapse on the horizon uh you know the job market right now doesn't look good Every, you know some places in the united states are still on lockdown what can people do to empower themselves to get through this um beyond just embracing religion, but more practical steps. I wondered if you had anything to add on that. Well, you, the only way what I'm gonna say makes sense is if you actually break religion, you gotta break the religion of self. You gotta understand something that you're, war most of us are worshiping ourselves. And it's all about not wanting to do anything that's uncomfortable. It's all about not wanting to turn, amend our life, not wanting to admit our, that we're, we're making mistakes, we're going wrong, even though our life shows all the signs with the amount of addiction to pornography and addiction to sex and addiction to all kinds of ridiculous substances, even food. So you got you have to deny yourself. These are just words from Christ. You got to deny yourself if you want to find yourself. You got to deny yourself. You got to die to your old self. You got, and the only, and that's step one. And I just made that up. Actually, Christ's step one is repent. But before we repent, you got to recognize, look, I have to set myself aside. Repent. What does repent mean? Uh, repent means recognize you ain't right. Recognize that you're not living right. Recognize the folly in our so-called freedom. Most of what we call freedom is slavery. You are a slave to your desires, slave to your sins, slave to the media and the music and, 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 the, and the subversion of this day. You're a slave, we're all slaves. Recognize that. And, rec and if, we, if we wanna know why our life is not working is because we're slaves to the wrong thing, right? So repent, recognize that you've made yourself into a slave to this fallen world. And it's, a, and it's ruled by your fallen nature and the rulers of this world, the demons of this world. So you gotta recognize you did wrong, but repent actually come full circle means turn around amend your life. This is Jesus. He says, repent and believe. Recognize you wrong, turn away from your ways. And then, you know how you have faith? This is St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas says, you don't, it's so easy to say, okay, just believe, right? Well, then where, how do I believe? Why I believe? You believe so that you, so that you can know. St. Augustine says, I don't know so that I can believe, but in our world, because we worship the almighty brain rather than spirit, it's no, I need proof so that I can believe. 
What St. Augustine says, no, believe so that you know. So you ha- what does that require? Courage. Why courage? Faith. It means you don't know, but take a dive. Jump into it. And then you'll be led to that which you need to experience, that which you need to read, those people you need to speak to, all those various things that are going to build your faith. And so that's it. I'm not even making that up. Like I said, those are words of Christ. Repent and believe in the kingdom. All right. Well, Elliot, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, I just want to say that I'm part of your King Transformation Group. And I got to say it is a really uh, profound experience of me having to go through that. I think you put together a great package. And thanks for coming on and sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. My pleasure. It was great being here with you, brother. All right, man. You take care. Thanks.